Shalom and welcome. My name is Christian Barry Nuevo from Love Israel, Australasia. I'd like to welcome you once again to today's program. The theme for today will be an end times discussion. Very relevant, especially in today's climate. So I hope you will be blessed with today's discussion from a biblical perspective. So I'd like to thank you and welcome Dr. Baruch Corman from Israel. Hey, Christian, it's also nice to see you. I'm sorry we couldn't be together face to face in the same room, but this also uh, works. It works, correct. And it, it's a very interesting discussion that we're having on end times. Um, there is a lot of discussion, as we know, about end times recently, uh, not only in the US, in Australia as well, but all over the world. But the thing that worries me a little bit is that a large number of these discussions or teachings that are held are not really based on scripture. And as we know, uh, the word of God is the only authority, a reliable, true authority that we need to look at, uh, especially in these days. So thank you for your time and for having this discussion today. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm really, really thrilled that we're doing it. And I agree, agree with you. You, so many people have strong opinions, and then when you begin to discuss it with them, not even argue with them, but just just relate scripture to them, it's like they never realize that this scripture spoke to this issue. So it's problematic to have strong opinions when you haven't consulted the main Bible verses on a given issue. Wonderful. And I also agree. I mean, everyone has their own interpretation of certain scriptures that we'll be you know, unwrapping and unraveling a little bit here today in today's program. But I've always said that scripture should be able to interpret scripture on its own. Uh, we can, of course, ask for the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But um, you know, whenever people start putting in their own ideas and their own scenarios, that's when I usually just tell people just walk away, walk the other way. So it's great that we can look at a number of scriptures and a number of scenarios here that we're really going to look at it from a biblical perspective. So let's kick it off. I'm just going to uh, share our screen very quickly. And that way we can start looking at each of the scriptures one by one. So I guess the first one is, the question is more that what is the biblical difference between the terms tribulation and wrath? Just before I just hand over to you, Baruch, I've noticed as well, and, and it's about uh, not letting people deceive you. Um, I've noticed that a lot of Bible teachers or, or people that teach on the end times, they're so adamant about a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, and they always just go to scriptures that just say, well, we're going to escape God's wrath, which I agree. And I'm sure we're going to touch on right now. However, escaping God's wrath is very different to experiencing tribulation or trials or difficult times. So I'll just hand over to you, Baruch. What are your comments on this specific question or comment? Well, many of the things we're going to be dealing with, I would say primarily, is understanding what the scripture, what Paul says in, in Titus 2.13, he calls our blessed hope. We see many other places, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, also, 1 Corinthians 15, speaking about an event, an event that Paul calls a mystery, whereby the believers are going to be removed from this world. Oftentimes, it's spoken of as the rapture. And as, as you pointed out in this first question, there is the term tribulation. You mentioned pre-tribulation. Well, we need to define what tribulation is. And when we do so in the scripture, we see many places that tribulation is applied to believers, that we're going to suffer tribulation, trials, hardships, persecution, the, the attacks of the enemy, the world. And this is called tribulation. So it refers to suffering in a general sense. Right. And we are promised not to escape that, quite the contrary. It says, for example, in Acts 14, verse 22, it's necessary to go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. 
So we have to be careful. We're going to suffer. We're going to encounter tribulation. But as you pointed out, the promise is, and we'll hopefully come to that and deal with the scripture, but there's a promise that we will not experience the wrath of God. So we will experience tribulation, but we will not experience God's wrath when it begins to fall. The question we need to, to deal with is, when does God's wrath fall within the last days? And the last thing I'll say is that commonly it's referred to Daniel's 70th week, these last seven years, that they are the tribulation period. Some people use the term the great tribulation for that period. And we need to be very careful and not simply apply tribulation to that term, that seven years, that last seven years. Does the Bible clearly say that it's a tribulation period? And furthermore, does the Bible say that we should define our understanding of the rapture in light of those seven years? Nowhere in the scripture does it say that the rapture is understood in light of that 70th week, that last seven years of Daniel. I believe it's related, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, as we get further into our discussion. Sure. And, and I think that's why it's so important to have this discussion. I've noticed that some people are very passionate about, you know, their stance, whether it be pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. But And look, it's, I, I appreciate that some people have different views, but some people are overly zealous about the pre-tribulation, which there's nothing more that I will want more than, you know, for the Lord to come and return even tonight. Uh, I think we're all eagerly awaiting his return, but I think equally just as important is the fact that we need to look at scripture to make sure that we're prepared, actually prepared when difficult times come, which they will come. And we're seeing a pattern of that now. I'm sure you would agree. So Christian, let me, let me clarify. Are you, are you saying that you see a danger that if people believe that, will be removed from this world prior to any great persecution and suffering that they'll be unprepared for that and be caught off guard and and maybe their faith will will be really challenged and it will be a moment of theological just doubt and confusion correct and like i said i'm hoping that it is a pre-tribulation but uh, we need to be realistic and be prepared. Let, let's let the word and the Holy Spirit prepare us because if that does not occur, then there's going to be a lot of disappointed believers in the world who we don't know how they're going to react. So I agree. It's very important that they are prepared uh, for difficult times to come. So we'll just go for the next uh, question that what are the implications of 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 in regards to the rapture? Well, this scripture tells us that God has not appointed us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. And many times the word salvation, we can maybe understand it in simpler English with the word victory. So God's going to give us victory and we praise him for that. And we know that we're going to experience that victory prior to, and this is the important word. And by the way, there's two different Greek words Philipsis for tribulation, which were promised, but we are promised that we'll never experience God's wrath, his, his all-consuming, his destroying anger upon those who have rejected his grace. So I see 1 Thessalonians 5.9 as a foundational verse. It's the promise that we cling to. We won't go through God's wrath. Therefore, and we'll get more related to this in a, in a moment, perhaps. But the question that people have to answer is, when does God's wrath begin? We're not promised to avoid tribulation. We're promised to go through hardships, trials, persecution, and that word tribulation. But here we have a clear teaching, undeniable. God has not appointed us for wrath, but salvation. So the question that people, and we just pose that to them, when does God's wrath begin in the last days? Yes. That is what we need to be looking for, not a false promise that we're not going to go through hardships. And that's and I appreciate you explaining things like that because I know that there's probably some people that will be watching that are probably right now writing to us saying, 
now, but it's pre-tree because we've been promised to, that we're going to escape God's wrath. But I appreciate your explanation because it, it's crystal clear. So thank you for that. What does Yeshua, Jesus, in his teachings from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 42, reveal concerning the rapture? This, this is such an important passage. In the first part of Matthew 24, he, he outlines the birth pains, the sorrows, things such as wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, and that's in the plural, uh, uh, earthquakes, famines, and believers being persecuted for, for their faith. And then in verse 14, he speaks about the gospel being proclaimed. And then in verse 15, he speaks about the abomination of desolation. And immediately after his talk about the abomination of desolation, which we'll mention more, I'm sure, later on, there's an emphasis upon Israel, what in that passage is called the land of Judah, the Jewish people going through tribulation, going through great not the great tribulation, but great tribulation. And then after coming to the time of his second coming, in verse 32, he stops and he says, and he goes back to speaking to believers. He's outlined things and he tells us to watch the fig tree. Mm. So he's speaking to the world, primarily to disciples, disciples throughout all times, but especially the last days that we need to be watching the fig tree Israel. And then he goes in the, in the passage that you referenced, verses 36 through 42, he talks about the days of Noah. And I believe most, most Christian scholars see a correlation between the flood, God bringing the flood upon the, the world, and God bringing wrath, that the flood is a typology of God's wrath. And in that, he says something. He says, just like in the days of Noah, People were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage. So it was relatively normal. And then suddenly the, the, the waters came and surprised people. Well, when we're talking about the second coming, we know that prior to the second coming, we see those trumpet judgments, those, those bowls or vile judgments that are anything but normal. So this tells us, that, that prior to, and in that passage, it talks about one being taken, one being left. One being taken, one being left. Most scholars see that this is an image of the rapture. And therefore, when we look at verses 36 to 42, it tells us that, that God's going to remove us prior to his wrath coming on. That he's going to be taking people away in a, in a great assembly. So that's why this, this section is so important. It, it verifies what we just talked about in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, mm. that, that God's removal, just like Noah and his family entered into the, the great ark and, and they were lifted up above the waters, so too are we going to be lifted up above the wrath and we'll be lifted up into the kingdom of heaven prior to the wrath of God falling. So that's why these, these verses are so significant and related to the rapture. Once again, the rapture happens prior to the wrath of God. Just a couple of things, Baruch, on that. When we look at Matthew 24, 36 to 42, I've had some people make some comments to me, especially about the first part when we're told in Scripture, but at that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Some people have just questioned this as a side note. What about the son, Yeshua? They are the, the son and the father as one. They've always raised the question to me, wouldn't Yeshua, Jesus, also know that they are the other? Well, one of the things that the scripture speaks of, and we always have to, to pay attention how Yeshua is being spoken of. And when he's spoken of as the son of man, that term relates to servant, in modern Hebrew, the term Ben Adam, son of man, is a colloquium for human being. So he's an example to us. And his, his example is one that submits to the one who sent him, to his father. So the reason why the scripture says that uh, 
No one knows, not the angels, not even the son, only the father, is that Yeshua is showing total submissiveness in the same way that the scripture says he emptied himself. Now, he never stopped being the divine son of God. He never ceased being God. He fully became man, but he was always, there was never a time that he wasn't fully God. But he did not oftentimes use his, his authority, his power as God to accomplish things. He did them in subjection to his father and, and being fully man. And in this right. same way, it speaks of his submissiveness, his sonship, his humanity, and that he is waiting just like we are called to wait for the instructions of the Father, for the events, for God the Father to put this into to action. Right. Before we proceed to the next one, you touched on the parable of the fig tree as well. Uh, on those scriptures, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation by no means will pass away until all these things take place. People have also come to me and said to me, the fig tree, of course, is Israel. And please jump in, correct me at any time. Um, is that making reference to the end times, the rapture, or the second coming that all these things will happen, but that generation will not pass away until all these things take place? Is this looking at Israel when the rebirth of Israel in 1948? Yeah, no, I, I don't believe it has anything to do with the, the rebirth of Israel, the fo founding of the modern state of Israel. I believe that when we see the birth pains, mm -hmm. when we see these wars and rumors of wars, the famines, the earthquakes, the persecution intense like never before persecution of, of, of Christians for their faith. When these things happen, then we know that we're in the last generation and both the rapture and the second coming because they're, they're relatively close together. Uh, if they're pre-tribulation, we're talking about seven years. Um, if, if, we're, if someone is post-tribulation, it's, it's one immediately after the other. So at maximum, we're talking about, depending upon where someone is, maximum seven years. So all of these things are going to happen within a generation. And I would argue that a generation is, is approximately 20 years. Some would say up to 40. But regardless, we're speaking about when the, the birth pains begin until the establishment of the kingdom. We're talking about, let's just say, no more than 40 years. Okay. But, it, but it does not have to do with the, the founding of the nation of Israel. It has to do with what Messiah spoke of in Matthew 24, for example, beginning in verses 6, 7, 8, 9, those things. Okay, now thanks for clarifying that. Quite a few people came to me with that question, so thank you. Also in Matthew 24, the term end appears a few times. What specifically the end to which Yeshua is referring to in Matthew 24, 14? Yeah. You know, one of the reasons why we're doing this is, is not to try to influence people to believe one thing or another. We want to encourage people to study, to show themselves approved. Mm -hmm. and, and so often people form opinions and they do not realize, well, in order to come to a conclusion, you need to consider all the evidence of the scripture. And so one of the things I, I frequently ask people is just this question. In Matthew 24, we find that word end appearing frequently. What end is it referring to? And if people have no idea that the word end appears there and what it is, are they really then prepared then to comment on the issue? The word end that he's referring to, and we'll go back to Matthew 24, verse 14, where he says, prior to the end, before the end comes, the gospel needs to be preached to all the nations as a testimony unto them. Then the end will come. What end is he referring to? The end of the church age in this world. Because immediately after speaking about the gospel being proclaimed to all nations, the next thing he says is the abomination of desolation. So significant that Paul emphasized this event in regard to, to his teaching on the rapture. And we see that Messiah speaks also, emphasizes this event 
when the Antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies and proclaims himself as God, we, we see that when that happens, this is going to be the last thing that is seen prior to that blessed hope taking place. So very, very important. Okay. And I think we're going to touch on that a little bit later on as well. So thank you for that. So the, you touched on this earlier as well, the great tribulation. To whom does the scripture reveal the great tribulation concern? Yeah. Now, you know, our, our knee-jerk reaction and what people think by the term the great tribulation, and we need to always make a distinction between, for example, I believe in Matthew 24, verse 21, speaking about Israel, it says, then there will be great tribulation. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between the term great tribulation and the great tribulation. In the Greek language, there's the definite article, and the definite article specifies it speaks to something that is specific so you go to a restaurant or you go to the restaurant one that people specifically know which one you're referring to people think the great tribulation must be the final must be the one in the end of the end times re referring to the wrath of god but oddly when we look at the scripture where it appears in Revelation chapter 7, the great tribulation has to do with believers. And it has to do with their persecution. We should say our persecution. And why, why Messiah emphasizes this term, the great tribulation for believers, mm -hmm. is that he's emphasizing how significant it is for people to suffer in his name. Suffer for his purposes, suffer because of the faith that, that, that he established. So the great tribulation isn't associated with God's wrath. It is not associated with the, the uh, second half of Daniel's 70th week, but rather it's associated with what I would see as, as the first part of the last seven years when believers are going to be to be persecuted this is very dear in in the eyes in the heart of god to see people suffering in in regard to his name his purposes the faith that that he shared right okay thanks for that clarity i think this ties with this one as well what is the difference between the great tribulation and great tribulation yeah the the, in the scripture, when it speaks about great tribulation, it, it refer, refers to Israel's suffering. It goes along with uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, when it speaks about Etzerachi le Yaakov, which means a time of trouble, uh, a time of trial for Jacob, meaning Israel. Mm -hmm. This is great tribulation. But the Great Tribulation specifically refers to believers being persecuted for their faith. Right. Thank you. This one is quite an interesting one. Is the Great Tribulation before or after the abomination of desolation? What is the biblical support or verses for one's answer? So I'll open to you and then I've got some comments here and some uh, questions or more, more from a clarity perspective that I'll, I'll, I'll get from you. This is such a foundational question. And when we look at the term, the great tribulation, it only appears one time in Revelation chapter seven. And many people understand this as, well, there's going to be a group of people left behind after the rapture. And they're going to, the ones left behind that are going to come to faith that they're going to be the group that comes out of the great tribulation. There, there's a problem with that. First of all, when, when John writes the book of Revelation, he, he speaks of disciples and he's speaking to disciples that are be going to be going through these events. That's his emphasis. And when you look at Revelation chapter seven, beginning with verses 9, 10, through probably the end of the, the chapter, what we find here is that there's going to be a group of people who suffer 
tremendously for, for their faith. My view is that these are believers in the last days that are going through the events of the book of Revelation. And we find that they're given a white robe and such. But as we, we proceed in this same section, we find that what is said concerning them is also applicable to all believers. That, that the, the things that this, this group is receiving, it's not exclusive to them. For it says that, that we're going to be before the throne of God, that we're going to worship him, that, that there's not going to be any harm that comes to, to them any longer. It's speaking about simply a kingdom experience, God's great blessings in his kingdom for believers through all the different epoch of times. But John is emphasizing the, the ones who experience the events that he wrote about. So this is speaking about the great tribulation, those who suffer the worst time of persecution for believers ever. So that's what we have to, to be prepared for. That's what we should be praying for. When we, we look at this, it would seem that the abomination, the abomination of desolation, which is, and Daniel talks about this in Daniel chapter 11. We see it also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the abomination of desolation happens. And then afterwards, Israel is going to be persecuted. One, one question that I receive so frequently that, that I see troublesome is that many Christians believe that Israel is going to receive the Antichrist. This is not the case whatsoever. When the Antichrist ultimately demands to be worshipped, to be embraced, Israel is going to reject that. That is the basis for Jacob's trouble their rejection of the Messiah. This is when they're going to go through great tribulation. So great tribulation is after the abomination of desolation. What we're going to find is that when the Antichrist comes to power and the temple is functioning, it's going to be believers that are going to be speaking against his corruption, his administration, what his policies are. And this is going to bring persecution upon us. And my own opinion, and I'd, I'd love to hear what you, you think about this, but I see well, right now we, we are seeing believers being persecuted more today than 10 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Absolutely. Very quickly. The, the, the yeah. persecution is growing and rights to worship God are being attacked like never before in places. For example, I was listening to a discussion, a well-known uh, preacher in, in America, and he was talking about how in his state, unless the, the institution, his seminary, upholds homosexuality, it was what was being uh, um, promoted or suggested was that there would be no financial aid from the, the state, which also connects it to the federal government that students wouldn't be eligible for that. And I think he said something like 80% of, of those in his school receives that. So we're being challenged to conform to the ways of the world. If not, well, right now there can be fiscal persecution, but in many places we're seeing physical persecution. And that is gonna happen prior to the abomination of desolation because shortly after the abomination of desolation, no man knows the day or the hour, but from what we look at Paul's writing, shortly after the abomination of desolation, this is when the rapture is going to happen. But again, we don't know the day or the hour, but this is going to be the last event. And that's why Messiah mentions it in Matthew 24, verse 15, in speaking about the end. I guess that's that's a good discussion point because I have a lot of people that I know that tell me, well, how is it possible that the church will still be here when we know that the Antichrist, well, he's going to affirm or establish a covenant, a peace treaty for seven years. The believers that read their scriptures, um, they will automatically know that that person is the Antichrist. 
Now, whether it be for a short period of time or three and a half years until, uh, you know, he basically sits on that throne and declares himself to be God. The question is raised, how can millions of Christians or believers be on the earth still, not being raptured? Wouldn't they be exposing him as the Antichrist? Uh, I, I certainly believe and hope that will be the case. And, and I also see that as one of the basis for our opposition being the basis for intense persecution. You know, there were some, some very popular books written about the rapture mm -hmm. uh, in the, I believe, in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the Don't Left Behind series. That. Yes. The Left Behind series, exactly. Yeah. And, and in that, and I think there was another movie that maybe they did or other people did, where they see the rapture as some event that all that's going to shock the world, mm. that that's going to be just a, a, a tremendous catalyst for people to say, "Well, what happened?" and and maybe even be used to bring people to faith. Now, this is great to sell mo movies or books and make movies, but we don't see that in the scripture. The scenario that I would present is this that there's going to be more and more believers when we start speaking against things that we're going to be marginalized, that we're going to be arrested, that we're going to be persecuted. Many of the scripture says that we'll be put to death. So I see when the rapture happens, I believe shortly after the abomination of desolation, it's not going to be some event where the world just takes notice of it because just like in, in the Holocaust, little by little, the Jewish people started just disappearing. Just one day, there was a, a family next door. Next day, there's not. Mm -hmm. People went on with their life and, and such. And, and many people were amazed, and I believe sincerely amazed, that six million Jewish people were, were killed during this, this relatively mm -hmm. short period of time. They saw just you know, little by little disappearing, not, not this fast number. And I, and I see that same thing with, with the persecution of believers. So I don't see the rapture as going to be this, this event that's going to, the news media is going to be covering and everything. I believe so many Christians will have been removed, put to death, arrested, disappeared, fired from jobs, scattered, that it's not going to be some major event that's going to appear on on the news in the evening and that's and that's why i just uh stopped sharing the screen for a moment because I, I think we need to open this up a little bit more for dialogue um i think then that would make sense because and i'm jumping a little bit ahead here but you'll see my point it talks about a seven-year tribulation period so from my understanding is and once again please correct me if i'm wrong right away um the first three and a half years of the so-called peace treaty that's enforced by the Antichrist will be a wonderful time of stability, economic growth, peace and security. It'll be a false peace and security, of course. Um, and then three and a half years into that peace agreement, that's when he will actually declare himself to be God and sit at the temple, correct? Yes, uh, I, I would say that there's an agreement, and that agreement will bring about peace, but, but really that, that treaty, that covenant, is one about the temple. The temple's going to begin to function at the beginning of those seven years. Now, I do believe, as you pointed out, these seven years are going to be full of hardships, initially for believers, and then there's going to be the wrath of God falling. So these seven years are going to be times of tribulation, but, but we don't see biblically ever this period of seven years, Daniel's 70th week, that last 70th year. There's not a verse of scripture that says that it's a tribulation period. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of this tribulation is going to begin prior to. There's going to be great instability prior to that. When the birth pangs begin, whether they begin leading up to the seven years and 
and also carry on into it, whether they begin, I, I believe they, they precede the, the last seven years. So we're going to see tribulation in the world instability leading up to this agreement. And the Antichrist is going to solve so many problems in the world. And the world's going to love that. The peace, just like you mentioned, the peace, the security, the prosperity, he's going to do all of that. But when we see the ungodliness, the immorality, the attacks uh, against truth, and what he's going to be, be instilling, it's going to be people like you and your family and, and my family and people that, that are, are true believers in, in this book. We're going to be speaking out. We're going to be saying this is not of God. This is of the enemy. And this is when we're going to be persecuted. So in essence, for the first three and a half years of that peace treaty where the Antichrist will be reigning on earth, in a way, it is tribulation for believers because we're going to be so outspoken against the Antichrist that it'll only be persecution to real believers, correct? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that, that's exactly what, what I believe. And it's going to be very significant on, on how many believers will stand up against this or how many will just capitulate and go along with it. My, my great concern is, and we know that in speaking concerning the Antichrist, you know, John in his epistles, First John, for example, mentions in light of the Antichrist activity, there's going to be many that go out from us, meaning leave the faith. And he says, because they were never of us. And this is the proof. So we're going to see a real departure from the actual what we could call the, the church of God. There's going to be a departure, a great departure. And this is this falling away that, that is going to be accompanied with apostasy. Right. And, and that's excellent because that need, leads to the next uh, screen for discussion uh, on the apostasy, actually. So what is what does the Bible mean by the term apostasy? Well, I, I have a, a good friend that, that lives in, in Texas. I have super amount of respect for him, but, but we strongly disagree on, on this meaning apostasy. And he correctly points out that the word simply is a departure, and that's true. He sees the word apostasy, meaning departure, relating to the rapture itself. Right. I, I find that as a very problematic and, and unscriptural understanding, because when we look at departure or apostasy, a, a scripture that comes into my mind, it only appears, that word only appears in, in uh, three or four places in the whole scripture. But Paul, I believe in Acts 21, 21, he's accused of apostasy, heresy. And what it says here is that he's departed from the, the law of Moses, that he has told people, do not circumcise your children, do not keep, <coughs> excuse me, with the customs and the teachings of Moses. He's being falsely accused. He's being called a heretic. And this is what apostasy is. It's a departure from truth. It's always a departure from that which is good, to that which is not good. So that's why the rapture doesn't fit the, the, the definition because we're leaving this world. This is a bad place. It's stained with sin. It's corrupted. It's a world of darkness. We're leaving that and we're being taken into the kingdom of God, a good place to be with him. Another place that this word apostasy appears, and it, it may surprise people, but that word appears in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31 in a most peculiar use. There's in the scripture, in the Hebrew Bible, there's what's called a, a sefer kritut. Kritut is the word for cutting, and it has to do with a certificate of divorce. And I find it so significant that when Messiah on the Sermon on the Mount, when he was speaking about divorce and, and what the Torah says and why the Torah says and, and such about a man giving his, his wife a certificate of divorce, he calls it 
a certificate of apostasy. Amazing to me. And, and people can check this out. Matthew chapter 5, verse, verse 31. And the reason is that you're leaving a good thing and going to something that, that's not good. So it says a lot about divorce, the seriousness of that, that God would use that same word. So apostasy is a falling away, a departure from the truth, from that which is good, that which is related to God's will, to something that is not God's will. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I, I had a recent interview on the apostasy, and uh, we spoke about that interview. And, um, I mean, the, the things that we're seeing now in so-called churches, how they're falling away from biblical, um, you know, just anything to do with scripture is just staggering. The things that are being taught, whether it be the prosperity gospel that just focuses on now and not in eternity, things that you see that happen sometimes in churches uh, doesn't edify the body of Christ and certainly doesn't give glory to God in any way, shape or form. So I agree with you 100%. And, and it's a very, it's starting to take a lot of momentum all over the world uh, in different types of denominations and churches. But uh, it's actually uh, to a point where it's alarming. Um, I know that we probably differ a little bit in terms of, even though none of us know the day or the hour of the rapture, but I'm actually thinking that we, we the apostasies, you know, we're seeing a lot of momentum taking place at the moment that um, it, it's a great concern. A lot, a lot of I, I, I strongly concur. I, I also believe that we are seeing the beginning of the apostasy. And I think, I don't remember the exact term that you use, but it's the changes that are happening within the evangelical world are, are taking place at an alarming rate. The, the departure, I heard someone who comes from a very you know, sound biblical upbringing. His father is, is, is a very well-known known pastor. In, in the United States. And he was just speaking, I, I just heard it about a week ago, and he was basically saying, let's not emphasize truth because we're gonna disagree with, with, with truth, the views concerning it. But, but we're gonna emphasize keeping unity at all costs. So what he was saying was, let's set truth aside and let's just be unified in, in a variety of different views. Well, it's truth that brings unity. And it's, it's just the foundation for allowing false teachings, uh, heresy and such into the body of believers because the institution becomes the important point, not serving God. Couldn't agree with you more. In addition to 2 Thessalonians 2, if you can name two other places the term apostasy appears. Well, you've touched on that. So, yeah, we, we mentioned Acts 21 21 and Correct. also Matthew chapter Matthew. 5, verse 31, those two. Now, this next question is very important. We, we always get a lot of contention with this. Everyone has different views. So, what is the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ? Well, I, I think that there is a, a strong consensus that the day of the Lord is a term that refers to the time of God's wrath being poured out upon the world. And this is something that we all want to miss. We don't want to be here. And that's why when we look at, for example, the, the two epistles to, to the Thessalonians, we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the subject is the day of the Lord, yep. understanding that. God pouring out his anger, his, his wrath. When we get to chapter or second Thessalonians at the end of chapter one, it speaks about this same thing. And then in chapter two, which I believe is one of the most significant chapters in, in understanding our, the, the subject at hand, the rapture, the Thessalonians are not concerned that they missed out on the day of the Lord. We all want to miss out on the day of the Lord. We don't want to be here. They're concerned that they missed out on another concept, and that is the day of Christ. Now, many people, they're not familiar with that term, and that's why 
so many of the modern translations. I believe the King James maintains the day of Christ, but so many other ones just put the day of the Lord in because it's much more familiar. They may make a note at the bottom that the best manuscripts have the day of Christ, but it's something that, that we're not familiar with. But it might surprise now in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is mentioned repeatedly. But in the New Testament, the day of the Lord is mentioned very infrequently. It may be alluded to, but that term, very, very few. But the day of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus, one of those terms refers to the blessed hope, the rapture. Mm. And I, I would call our, 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 our listeners, our viewers to read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. It speaks about the, the Thessalonians, their, their concern. And Paul says, I, I don't want you to be, be ignorant. I don't want you to not understand something that are gathering together unto him. And what's so neat here, and, and the Greek language is such a marvelous language because it has a word for synagogue, a place of gathering together. And it makes that word synagogue as a verb. So as we come together and then it places a prefix that's very odd, which means unto or upon or together. And then after that, it has a word before Christ. It has that same prefix. It's very redundant. It would be seen in classical Greek as not good grammar. But in the Greek of the New Testament, it's emphasizing in, in three different ways us coming together unto him. It's not speaking about the second coming at the end of the day of the Lord, whereby Messiah comes to establish his church, or excuse me, comes to establish his kingdom at the end of the seven years, but it speaks of us being gathered, us assembled unto him, and it mentions that twice, unto him. Most of the English just mentions it once, but the Greek has two references to that. And this is the day of Christ. The day of Christ is another term that relates to the rapture. And I wrote down, of course, we, we, we knew what you, we, you were going to bring up. But this term is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I believe verse, verse 11. Mm -hmm. And then in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, and also in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 16. Right. So here it appears also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it appears uh, six times the day of Christ, and it speaks of the rapture, the day that Messiah comes and gathers up his church, his believers, and, and removes us from this world into the kingdom of heaven so that we escape God's wrath, that we escape the day of the Lord. So sorry, leading on to that. So how many times does the term the day of the Lord appear in the New Testament? I, I believe just one, the actual term, the day of the Lord, only appears one or two times throughout the whole New Testament. Now it's alluded to, mm -hmm. described much more, but sure. the term, yeah. I believe, yeah. only appears one or two times. Okay, great. Thank you. What are the significant implications that Daniel 9 Verses 24 to 27 has for the church. Well, it's it's commonly when 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 people use this, and this is the the famous prophecy, a wonderful prophecy about the 70 weeks. Yeah. And when you come to the last last verse of that chapter, it focuses on that final week, that final seven years. Right. And what people will say is this: they'll say. You know, the church wasn't part of the first 69 weeks. Therefore, they can't be part of the 70th. And I cannot tell you the number of, of brilliant individuals, Bible teachers, uh, seminary professors that will make a statement like that. And I'm amazed because it's illogical. Mm. The church didn't exist in the first 69 weeks. And they're saying because of that, it can't. Well, why can't it? What, what, what is the prohibition? You know, I use the example. Uh, I may not be to your first 
49 birthday parties, but I could come to the 50th. There's nothing, the same thing here. Just because the church didn't exist in the first 69 doesn't mean that it can't be part. It's illogical. It's, it sounds good. Mm. It, it makes sense, but it's, it's, not, it's not factual. Just like it's very common, we spent a lot of time in, or we used to spend a lot of time in Eastern Europe before the coronavirus hit. And the Eastern Orthodox Church, whether we're talking about Ukraine, Romania, uh, Russia, even the Greek Orthodox, many times that they'll say something to the fact that Daniel 9, the 70th week, has nothing to do with the church, only to do with Israel. And I'm amazed by that because in that prophecy, it says Messiah is going to be cut off. I don't know if anyone that doesn't see this as relating to the cross mm. that has a lot to do with the church that that god's going to make an end of sin and he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness well i believe that has to do with the establishment of the kingdom of god seek first the kingdom of god and its righteousness daniel 9 24 through 27 has a great deal to do with believers the church the cross and the establishment of the kingdom of god that payment for sin so that we can be declared eternally righteous. That has everything to do with the church. And I would say more to do with the church than with Israel right. until Israel in the last days becomes part of God's, God's kingdom people. Yes, correct, correct. We've touched on this a little bit, but just want to open it up a little bit more that what is the purpose, for what purpose did Yeshua, Jesus, speak about the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15? Well, I, I think the, the important thing about this, this question is this. He talks about the end in the previous verse, the end of the mm -hmm. church age. The gospel is going to be preached to all the nations, then the end will come. And then he says, when you see, who's he speaking to? Well, in Matthew 24, he speaks exclusively to disciples. Throughout the whole, whole chapter, he's speaking to his disciples. But after he mentions the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, verse 15, there's a significant grammar change. Now, I have no problem with people disagreeing, seeing things different, a different interpretation. That's fine. But, but I ask them, what is the significance immediately after Matthew 24, verse 15, when he speaks about the abomination of desolation. For the next, from verses 16 through 31, he doesn't speak about believers. He doesn't speak about the church. He, he switches immediately thereafter and speaks about those in Judea. He talks about Israel. He speaks to us, but it's exclusively, verses 16 through 31 is exclusively about Israel Israel going through great tribulation, not the great tribulation, but great tribulation until Messiah comes the second time, not the rapture. That would have already happened. But the second time when he returns, not us being gathered to him, but him coming to earth for the purpose of establishing the kingdom. So Matthew 24, verse 15 is kind of that, that, that key verse that, that makes a distinction between his talk about the church and his talk about Israel. And it's so significant that Yeshua mentioned that event, and it's so significant that Paul does as well in his study or his teaching in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as the, the event that has to happen prior to the, the day of Christ. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. Switching gears a little bit, there's something that is, is very debated as well in terms of the restrainer. So concerning the restraining in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 to 7, what is the grammatical evidence that the restrainer cannot be the church? we we'll put there a hint that the restrainer is mentioned twice. In what grammatical gender the restrainer appears? I think I just want to add from my personal question and from what I've seen people debating for a very long time, some say it's the church. Some say it's the Holy Spirit. I personally don't think it's the Holy Spirit because after the rapture, people are still coming to a Messiah in faith. And I think 
the Holy Spirit is the one that touches people's hearts. I could be wrong, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that's usually, or some say that Father, Father God is the restrainer. So what's your view when it comes to well, restraining? What, when we look at it, we see that there, it begins in verse 6 where you, you, you know, and it, it's very kind of almost insulting, but we, we should know, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And really, we put the comma in the wrong place. It says, you know, concerning the restrainer, you know, and people think, oh, you know him. But if you read it carefully, what we know is about him. That, that we know his purpose. We know that he restrains mm -hmm. until the right time where the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And people make such dogmatic statements, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. the, the restrainers, the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit can restrain, but the problem is that they, they want to, to feed their own preconceived ideas and they, they talk about the removal until the restrainer is removed. Well, the word here is not removed. It's a word which simply means to move aside, uh -huh. just to move from the midst. It's not a removal from one location to another. And as you pointed out, the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. There's not a place that the Holy Spirit isn't. You Correct. can't remove him from the world. Correct. He, everywhere. Now, the second thing, and there's a very well-known, I don't know him personally, but he's, he's also, I live in Israel. I'm an Israeli citizen. He's also, I grew up in America and been here for 20 years. He was born here and, and such. And I, I believe he does a lot of great ministry and great work. But here's the problem. He has a teaching on this and he says, well, the word for the restrainer is the Greek pronoun ho, which means him. Well, that's true the second time that the restrainer is mentioned. The first time, it's not the word ho, it's the word to, which is neuter. Now, the Holy Spirit is in the neuter in Greek. It's the word panuma. Panuma is neuter. It's not masculine. It's not feminine in the Greek language. The, the, the emphasis here is that I don't believe that we can be dogmatic and say who the restrainer is. What we can say is what he does. Mm -hmm. And that is that he holds the Antichrist from being revealed until God says now. And we, we cannot be dogmatic about the identity. Now, if you ask me, I mean, everything's under the authority of God. God is the instrument that he's using, whether it's God, the father would be masculine uh, as it's in the second verse or the second, second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven and verse six, it's neuter. We can't be dogmatic on giving an identity. People want to say it's the church, but the reason why, and the question is, why can't it be the church? The term church ecclesia is in the feminine. Mm. We don't have a feminine pronoun. So they want to feed their, their own preconceived ideas. Oh, it's got to be the church. And, and because the problem, well, it's not feminine. Well, we'll say it's the Holy Spirit because they want to associate the Holy Spirit in the church. Of course, in order to be part of the, the church, you have to have the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is no longer simply defined as the church. He's never defined as simply the church. He existed. There was never a time that the Holy Spirit didn't exist. There was a time that the church did not. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the Holy Spirit is not dependent. They make the statement is that if the Holy Spirit's taken away, the church has to go with him. Well, the Holy Spirit's free. They're not one and the same. And it's heresy, in my opinion, to say that, that the, the Holy Spirit can be removed from this world. Not if the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. He's also omnipresent. Correct. I agree with that 100%. And I'm glad you touched on your comment that uh, nothing happens without God allowing it to happen. Um, he knows his perfect timing. He's on the throne. And everything that happens is because he permits it to happen. So 
Thank you for that response. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, appears a biblical word that describes the rapture. We've heard that. Uh, you taught on that in the first conference here in Australia about three years ago, which was fantastic. Uh, the word used is harpazo. Does this word relate to a preventing, uh, sorry, uh, preserving in place or a quick removal to a different location, like a snatching away? Yes. The, you know, many people say, oh, the, you know, there's a real attack today within the evangelical world and against also within the messianic, which I consider myself to be a, a messianic believer, a Jewish believer. There's a real attack on the whole doctrine of the rapture that many people deny it. And they'll say, well, the word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. Well, that's not exactly true. The word that you mentioned, arpazo, which, which does not, someone asked me, well, couldn't that mean that the church is just preserved here? No, that word aparzo, as you pointed out, means a quick removal, a snatching away, a transfer from one location to another. So it's not preserving, it's not securing something in the midst of it, it is removing. And the reason why we have the term rapture is that what happened was the word arpaso, which speaks about God removing, taking away, snatching away quickly. When we translate this word, Greek word arpaso, which means I snatch away, I remove quickly. When it's translated into Latin, and we know that the Bible was translated into Latin, it has a Latin word, and I'm not a Latin scholar, but rapturo, I believe. And that's where people start using the term rapture because it, it comes from the Latin term for this word. So in actuality, the word rapture, the basis for it, does appear in the Bible. Right. Thank you. This one is very interesting. It always generates a bit of conversation. When, when does the wrath of God begin in Daniel's 70th week? In, in, in my opinion, when we look at other scriptures, we find that the wrath of God only begins after the abomination of desolation. So Daniel, we know that in the middle of that week, in the middle of those seven years, at the three and a half uh, year mark, the abomination of desolation happens. Sometime after that, the rapture would occur. I'm not mid-tribulation. There's a lot of different theories and, and concepts and doctrines that is, are attached to what's called mid-tribulation. I, I, I'm not there. What I simply say is this. The rapture will take place prior to the wrath of God falling. We don't know the day or the hour of the rapture. We don't know the day and the hour of when the wrath of God is going to begin to fall but it will not begin to fall. And I believe it's shortly thereafter, but will not begin to fall until the abomination of desolation happens. What we see in the scripture is the antichrist. And as I said, Daniel makes this very clear in Daniel chapter 11, I believe in verse 35 or 36, Paul speaks about it as well in second Thessalonians two verses uh, three and four, that the antichrist is going to go into the Holy of Holies here again very interesting and people are not being diligent in their studies because in second Thessalonians chapter two, most Bibles will say that Messiah goes into the temple. Mm -hmm. This would be the Greek word Heron, but it doesn't say temple. It uses the word Neos, which is a term for sanctuary, which relates to the Holy of Holies. So the Bible's very specific here that the antichrist goes into the Holy of Holies he proclaims that he, he exalts himself. Daniel says this, and Paul does, above all that is called God, all that is holy, all that is of God. And he proclaims himself to be God. And this is when Israel will reject him. The Antichrist will begin to persecute Israel. And the wrath of God will soon begin to fall upon that evil empire. Obviously, before that wrath falls, we will be removed, not knowing the day or the hour, as the scripture says, but shortly after the abomination of desolation. So the wrath falls 
shortly after the abomination of desolation. Wonderful. I think that leads to the next slide that you've touched on that briefly, that what is the biblical sign that announces God's wrath? You, you, you briefly yeah. touched on that as well. Yes. Now, this, this is important because there's a confusion. We know the sign, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, verses uh, uh, 28, well, actually 29 and 30, those two verses speak about the sun turning dark mm. and the moon not giving its light. That is the sign of the second coming. That is not the sign of God's wrath. We know that when Messiah comes, it's at the end of God's wrath being poured out. He's bringing it to an end, the, the, the climax and the ending of God's wrath when Messiah returns. But prior to, prior to the wrath of God falling, we see something. It's mentioned Joel, two, Joel chapter 2 in the English Bible, Joel chapter 3 in the Hebrew Bible. It speaks about the sun turning dark, dark like sackcloth, but, but the moon turning red like blood. And we see that it says, this happens before the day of the Lord. And all who calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be delivered prior to God's wrath. So the sign of God's wrath is the sun turning dark and the moon turning red like blood. And what's interesting, and we have on the slide, Revelation 6, it's so significant. If we ask, when does the wrath of God begin in the book of Revelation? Well, it's announced in the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, if you begin reading in verse 12 to the end of that chapter, I believe in verse 17, right around there, it talks about the wrath of the lamb. This is the wrath of God. Messiah is going to, the lamb of God, Messiah is going to pour out his wrath. And it's the same sign. If you look at Revelation chapter 6, I believe verse 17, it says that the sun is going to turn dark and the moon is going to turn red like blood. So that is the sign that announces, and soon thereafter, the wrath of God begins to fall. In the book of Revelation, we know that in the next chapter, chapter 7, one of the angels says, hold on, don't harm anything until, and we see two events, Israel being sealed because Israel, unbelieving Israel, will be on this planet when the wrath of God falls. And then we see a description of those being taken out of this world into the kingdom of heaven before the throne of God. And I believe in verses 9 and 10 of Revelation chapter 7, we see an image of the rapture. But right. the wrath of God does not fall until actually chapter 8, beginning in chapter 8 with those trumpet judgments and then more intense later on in Revelation 16 with the bull judgments. Oh, correct. And a word of caution to all believers, I think you, you taught on this uh, quite a few months ago, Brooke, but uh, be careful what you hear from other people and other teachers that uh, they just want to sell books and sell videos about wolf moons and blood moons and uh, all these kind of things that they, they're already saying that uh, the rapture's at hand. You know, we, we always just plead with people, just go back to scripture. You know, look at the word of God. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that just want to be making sales and deceiving people. So just as a precaution, just uh, we say this, because I'll just be very careful what, who you listen to. Um, I think we've touched on this a little bit, but is there anything else you want to expand on, Brooke? Is there any biblical evidence to support all of Daniel's 70th week relating to the wrath of God? If so, what are the verses? Yeah, I, I don't know of any, and this is the, the real key question. If, if all of Daniel's 70th week is God's wrath, then mm -hmm. I believe the rapture precedes Daniel's yes. 70th week. I do not know a verse of scripture that, that says that all of Daniel's 70th week is, is God's wrath. Now, I know what many people, the standard answer is this. You look at such things as the seals, uh, in Revelation chapter 6, for example, we have a quarter of humanity dying. Correct. And, and people say, well, that has to be God's wrath. No, it, it, it's not. It's the enemy. It's, it's Satan. Nowhere does it say it's, it's God's wrath. So even though something might seem so horrible, and that would be 
just don't assume that that only God could bring about one fourth of humanity dying. Satan, he can as well. Here again, God will use it. God's not cause of it, but God can allow something. And one of the things I think that needs to be pointed out is many times, and it's such a struggle, the people who want to, uh, uh, the seeker movement and, and those that just want to fill their churches and stadiums and make everything pallet, they never talk about God's wrath, judgment, uh, uh, his standards or whatnot. But we need to realize something. The reason why God allows these hardships is because he wants people to repent and turn to him. And if there was any other way, if God could just say, you know what, here's a great book, read this and receive my, my, my promises. If people would do that, there wouldn't be many of the things in this book, but he knows that, and I, I can speak to myself, stubborn heart. Mm -hmm. The Bible speaks about having a, a heart in the book of Jeremiah as a strong muscle, meaning that, that we, we tend not to think and respond like God wants us to. And what is God's instrument to, to change that heart? Well, it's, he loves us, he gives us grace, he gives us wonderful promises, but we ignore them more often than not. It's not until we go through trials and tribulations and hardships and such that we start turning to God and we're broken down. So right. that's why we're gonna have this, these trials and tribulations because of the hardness of, of our hearts and our, our stubbornness of our mind. Correct, correct. Baruch, why is Revelation 4 verse 1 unrelated to the rapture? It simply says that, and many people say, oh, well, as John's going up to heaven, this is the rapture. Well, so many people teach that, but all it says is that John's going up. And it's very dangerous for us to symbolize scripture and say, well, John, it says John, but, but it's, it's symbolic for, for the church. When we start using that type of methodology to, to interpret the scripture, we can make the Bible say almost anything. And that's why we have to be very precise. John's going up. A change of location usually means in the Bible a change of perspective. He's being given a heavenly perspective. And most of the book of Revelation, John views while he's in the heavens, why he's taken up there and given these visions. So it has nothing to do with with the with the rapture right thank you we're looking at please read carefully revelation 3 verse 10 there john speaks of the hour of temptation to whom does he say the hour of temptation is for what is the biblical evidence to support the answer yeah. revelation chapter 3 if we look at this this section he's, he's speaking to to a church Mm -hmm. But in that section, he speaks about the hour that's coming upon, and it's very important, the dwellers of the earth. When one studies the book of Revelation, they see that there's two groups that, that John addresses. Those who dwell in the heavens, those who dwell in the earth. And it has nothing to do with where they're physically located. It's an idiom. For those who are committed to the kingdom, to heavenly truth, and those who belong to the world. So the hour that is coming upon the earth, the dwellers of the earth, this what's mentioned in Revelation 3.10 is, is speaking about something that's coming in correlation with God's wrath, his judgment, this, this hardship that, that God's going to bring upon the world because of unbelief. It has nothing to do uh, uh, with, with the church. It's reference to non-believers. Okay. Although there is a theological practice to describe the timing of the rapture in regard to the tribulation period, for example, Daniel's 70th week, can you offer any biblical support which links the rapture with Daniel's week? Yep. I, I know of none. I know that theologians all the time, and we do that because it's so, so common to say, well, pre-tribulational, mid-tribulational, post-tribulational, that's what, what the theologians say. But the problem is there is nothing in the scripture that unites the rapture with Daniel's 70th week. Now, I believe it occurs within it, but there's no scripture that does that. It only unites it because 
we are promised not to experience God's wrath and God's wrath begins in Daniel's 70th week. But there's no scripture that, that you can link that 70th week either as a time of, of tribulation, as a time entirely of God's wrath, and nowhere does the Bible connect the rapture to Daniel's 70th week. As I said, it happens within it because we see scriptures that give us indicators, but there's no direct linkage in the scripture between Daniel's 70th week and the rapture. Thank you. I think that these end time discussions are so important. Anything prophetic is so important. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they say that approximately about a third of the Bible has some sort of prophetic. Um, is that correct? Say, I did not hear you, Christian, on that. They, they, they say that approximately a third of the Bible is prophetic. Is that correct? Approximately? Uh, yes, that's that's what I've been told, and, and I certainly uh, uh, don't dispute that. So much of even the, the book of Psalms has mm. a lot of prophecy in it. Um, yes. The it New just, Testament a lot. It just shocks me, though, that it's not being taught, especially in the days that we're in. And so that's why I thank you for, for your time and for, you know, opening up the scriptures and uh, teaching us these things. I think that the flip side is that we have to be very, very cautious, like I touched earlier on, because there's a lot of, uh, sadly, people that are being deceived with false teachings and people that are just out to make a buck. I'm sorry, but that's, that's basically what it is. And a lot of these people use Amos 3.7 as their uh, template scripture, uh, which basically says, the Lord says to us, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. If you can just give us your comments on that scripture and how people should be a little bit, well, very cautious about what they listen to, especially relating to end times prophecy. Well, I, I agree totally with that statement, but probably the caveat that's different between me and, and those that are using it oftentimes today is that the prophets that Amos is referring to here are the, the pro prophets in the scripture, not some modern day prophets. And, and let's, let's take advantage of the time that we're in. Um, I don't know of anyone that prophesied now I've heard after the fact that people have said it, but I don't recall anyone saying, I remember back in 2000, I believe in 2014, you mentioned the, the, the books that were written about the four blood moons. Right. And nothing happened in those, those two cycles of two years when there would be so-called four blood moons. The Bible only speaks about one, not four, but we're putting that aside. Nothing really of, of, of great significance happened. And then another, I believe, false teacher wrote a book about the Shemitah, and he totally took the biblical concept of that seventh year when you lay, you don't sow the fields, you don't harvest the fields. He used that, that biblical concept and put a, a, a totally unbiblical understanding of it, that it relates to judgment and such. And that we're in the Shemitah year and, and all and something big's going to happen and nothing did. And then we see, well, it's the Jubilee year after this, that it's so-called Jubilee year, the way that they figured it up and such. And in those four years, nothing happened of any real significance. And they were silent. No one apologized. No one said, I want to give you back money for the books that, that you bought that I sold that are totally false. But then we have this very significant event i mean i don't think it's it's unprecedented uh un, what's the word um it's Is never it? taken place before yeah. in my lifetime something of, of this magnitude the coronavirus where where the economy is being ruined and all of these things are being happening and you can't go uh, right now we're in a situation where we can't go legally more than a thousand meters from our home unless we're buying food for, for just food or, or some great necessity, uh, we're, we're confined. So many things happening. I don't recall one of these so-called prophets saying anything about this taking place. Don't, don't, don't know it. And in fact, one got up and made a proclamation, a prophecy that the coronavirus was going to dissipate totally by, and he gave a date. Well, that didn't come true. So I appreciate so much, Christian, you, you mentioning this perversion of, of Amos 
um, to, to try to, to, to manipulate people to believe, well, there's certain individuals here that have prophetic gifts that are going to be revealing things that we need to follow. And as you said, usually it always involves a, a purchasing of these prophetics. I don't ever recall Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or any Zechariah ever selling his prophecies. Don't recall that. No, neither do I. And look, uh, the other thing as well, apart from uh, coronavirus, it was, of course, the U.S. election. We touched briefly on that and the uh, Australasia conference that we held not long ago online. And, you know, there were countless and countless of so-called prophets that were all saying that Trump would win by a landslide and that a thousand angels were called from South America and a thousand angels from Africa. And, but what's sad is I, I don't get angry with those people because, you know, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. But it's tragic and it's sad that the leaves are getting sucked into that and they're being deceived by that. And that movement doesn't stop. It, it is so aggressive. I mean, recently they've been saying again all over the, uh, YouTube that, no, no, it doesn't matter what happens. By the Christmas Day, Trump will be in office and Biden will be kicked out. And, you know, one thing after another, but people still follow those ministries. So, you know, it is quite sad to see what's happening in these days. So I think the scripture that I wanted to bring, uh, that if you can uh, give us some comments, is Revelation 13, 9, where basically it says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If you can just expand on that a little bit. Uh, th this is such an important verse. It's, it's a phrase that appears seven times in Revelation 2 and 3 in regard to the church. And in Revelation 13, in verses, uh, I believe, 7 and 8 right there, it talks about the beast mm -hmm. coming against, and the beast is an empire, the empire of the Antichrist, coming against the saints and persecuting and overcoming. Now, it's a temporary victory that he has just like the enemy thought the cross was his victory when it really was his defeat and in the same way us losing our life is not a defeat because we believe in the resurrection and so in the same way that messiah laid down his life for victory we are going to lay down our life but we're going to experience victory with the resurrection and that's why that verse in, in Revelation 13, 9, when it says at the end there, he who has an ear, let him hear. It's a, a way grammatically, literally speaking and informing the reader, this here has to do with the church. Because those same things were said, that same phrase, let he who has an ear, let him hear, were said to each of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. So it's a hermeneutical device to help the reader understand that, that this section of Revelation 13 has great relevance to the church. Correct. Thank you. Many millions, if not billions of people will be looking to celebrate New Year's 2021. Um, there's two sides. A lot of people are being very optimistic about it. There's a lot of people talking about a great reset, which is, uh, in some people's minds, a very uh, dangerous agenda that's uh, being set at the moment. What would be your words, your comments, and your um, recommendations and encouragement for believers in the new coming year in terms of the importance of reading the Word of God, uh, spending a lot of time in prayer and the leading of the Holy Spirit, as well as abiding in Christ, in Messiah Yeshua? Because there are difficult times ahead. Um, what would be your comments to people watching this program? I'm of the opinion, based upon prophecy, that things are to get more difficult and that we need to, to utilize. There's a scripture that speaks about redeeming the times, that we need to be utilizing these times in order to share the message. When things are happening like this, I, I have seen people are more open for discussions about, you know, the Bible speaks about pestilence. The Bible speaks about denying human rights, being able to do certain things because of faith. And, and we're approaching some, some very similar things. And in my opinion, the Bible becomes more of interest to people. 
as they are seeing these, these happenings that's, that's really never happened in most of our lifetimes, these changes and power grabs by, by politicians, governors in, in states in the United States and, and officials and parliaments and such taking action that, that in many times they really don't have the authority to do. So we need to be alert. We need to be watching. And I think the, the consistent thing is that we're going to see the freedom that we have to assemble and, and worship God without uh, hindrance. That is going to be coming attacked more and more in the near future. Correct. Uh, we've seen also in the media that there's already a lot of promoting about the new strain of this virus. Um, you know, they, they're talking so much about the vaccine, and um, I think that's an agenda that's being pushed. But once again, sadly, I, I see a lot of fear still in believers, and, and we touched on this in one of our last uh, discussions that, you know, that scripture that is so clear that God did not give us a spirit of fear but a power of love and a sound mind. So just some of your closing comments to Brooke, especially to believers about anything they hear about this new strain. And yes, we have to be, you know, always diligent and, you know, uh, hygiene should always be in place, personal hygiene and washing hands and, and being smart and using your wisdom. But any closing comments that you have for believers listening to this, especially with the things that are coming up in the media? Well, we shouldn't be fearful. The scripture says, and uh, one that I like and I, I constantly refer to is Luke 21, verse 28, when it says, when you begin to see these things, and I, I don't believe we're seeing the things mentioned in, in, in Luke 21 yet, but I believe that, that they could come about very quickly, very quickly. And, and regardless, when we do see these things, it says, be encouraged, lift up your heads, Mm -hmm. This is a, a term that God's going to acknowledge us. So we shouldn't be fearful. We shouldn't be discouraged. These things, as Messiah said, these things have to be in order for what he has promised to take place and the largest number of people coming to faith. This is the way that's going to bring the largest number of people into the kingdom of God. These are happenings for that. We need to utilize these things not being fearful, not staying, you know, bunkered down at, at home, but being out sharing, being out, being encouragement, demonstrating that we don't fear, but that we have, have faith in God. Now, that doesn't mean that a believer won't get this virus, that believers won't die, but we're not called to avoid death. We're called to be faithful, and, and death for us is deliverance. So I'm not fearful of, of death. I, I, I am concerned with the, the weakness, in my opinion, the weakness that the church has demonstrated mm -hmm. in the midst of, of these things. Just totally back down, totally surrendered, totally in fear, won't come together. And, and I believe too many people are enjoying just not being part of, of what God is up to, the family, worship, and such very concerned about the the condition of the, the church today. Correct. So, brothers and sisters, for everyone watching this, you know, we really encourage you all, um, you know, seek the Lord while he may be found. And, you know, sometimes I minister to people and I talk to people about Messiah Yeshua and they'll tell me, you know, I'm not ready for this yet. I'm not ready to, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Uh, in the future, you know, Messiah accepted us the way we are so don't wait for that and none of us are guaranteed of tomorrow only god knows that so i encourage you all uh, like baruch said you know just uh, spend time in scripture do not have any fear and uh, let's see what the lord will do next so baruch i'd like to thank you again um and i look forward to another discussion in the very near future if anyone watching still hasn't subscribed, I really recommend that you please subscribe to this uh, Love Israel YouTube channel. And if you need any further information, please go to loveisrael.org. And once again, Brooke, thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate your time and, and your help and uh, your leadership in, in this discussion. Thank you. And to everyone watching, 
We bless you. Uh, we thank you for tuning in. We thank you for listening to this program and be blessed and shalom.